All right, so before we get started on the quiz, are there any questions or things that you want to start with um, besides the quiz? Okay, go for it. Is that a yep because you have questions or answering a previous something else? Chapter nine. Can I just count the number of double bonds? Oh, when you talk about aromaticity? So, no, um, not quite. So let's take a look at why that is. I'm going to pull the book over here so you can see exactly where I'm looking in case you want to. Um, in case you want to do this, um, or you want to look it up later. How do I get this bigger? Here we go. All right, so we're in chapter nine here before the reaction. No, it's, it's right. It's here. Okay. Um, so we're looking right here, 9-2. What is aromaticity? Um, okay, so in count lone pairs, it's a double bond. If the number is odd, then it's aromatic. Again, that's not quite right. So... Take a look at the official rules here, and we went through these in one of the classes too. Um, get my head out of the way. You have to have a ring with one 2p orbital on each atom. So that orbital can either be part of a double bond, uh, have a lone pair in it, or be totally empty. It has to be planar or nearly planar so that they all overlap, because if they're kind of going like this, then the, the p orbitals can't line up with each other. And then this 4n plus 2 rule. So the total number of pi electrons has to be one of these 4n plus 2 numbers. Um, so let's look at what that means for some of the more difficult ones. The video quality is bad. Yeah, um, so it is recording. So I don't know how the recording will turn out, but uh, hopefully it catches up. I think both of my kids are on zoom meetings right now too so our internet may just not be able to handle it right now um but yeah look at some examples and see what we mean here and we'll just flip back to this for, for some pictures um, and these are some examples i think we did in a previous class too so i'll, I'll try to draw extra big for the um for this blurry Um, all right, so one of the examples, so here's some different examples of kind of things that could or could not be aromatic, depending on how we um, count those electrons. Yeah, so that's that's the thing. It's like it works most of the time, um, but but there. But it's important to know the concept behind it so that you can figure out for those times when it doesn't work. Um, yes, it's always tempting to come up with simple rules to that are that work generally most of the time, 
But I think in this case, what the actual rule is not so complicated that we can't that we can't see that. Um, so in each of these, we have we have to look at the three conditions. Do we have a p orbital on each atom? Is it planar? And how do we count the number of pi electrons? Um, so for the, so that's a good question, Nicole. So the first one, this is pyridine. It does have uh, sp2 hybridization on each atom, so we've got a p orbital on each atom. And so the counting thing here is, if we just count the double bonds, we've got two, four, six. If we count the nitrogen lone pair, we've got eight. So we've got a different answer depending on whether or not we count the lone pair. And so to look at that, we have to examine the hybridization of that nitrogen and think about what's happening with those orbitals. Um, so this nitrogen, if we look at it, is sp2 hybridized. And, and we would count those three groups to make sp2 like this. One for the bond left, two for the lone pair, three over here. That's the three things that make it sp2. OK. We also can see that it has a double bond. Now, in sp2 hybridization, you have three hybrid orbitals and then one perpendicular uh, p orbital. So in the case of pyridine here, the nitrogen's p orbital is involved with this double bond here, which means the lone pair is not a part of the pi system. The lone pair is not in a p orbital. The lone pair is in a hybrid, an sp or sp2 orbital. Um, and I think we looked at this before. We drew, we drew it sideways to kind of picture that. So if we look at, at an aromatic ring, Side like this, and we have the p orbitals all around. And then take a look at the nitrogen hybridization. So, in this case, the lone pair is actually in one of the hybrid orbitals. An sp2 orbital, not the p orbital. The p orbital is what's involved with the double bond which if we drew individual double bonds might look like this, but we know in reality they're actually all shared all the way around. So if the lone pair is not a part of the pi system, then we can't count it uh, as part of the aromatic system. Actually, I'm going to change my example here. So now let's look down at thiophene, which is this S thing here. And let's examine why that's different. Um, so again, our carbons, we have sp2, 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 sp2. And then the sulfur here has two lone pairs and two bonds. So that means it can either be sp2 or sp3, depending on where those lone pairs are. So if we want it to be sp2 so that we can have open, uh, if we can have aromatics, um, then, then we can count one of those lone pairs as a part of the pi system, and then we have two, four, six, and we can, and that can be aromatic. Uh, okay, so for multiple rings, um, th it's the same concept. So let's take a look at. Um, Couple different possible ones here. So we can look at this one. And actually, let's put. Make it a little more interesting. Okay. So let's say we have something like this. Um, we can clearly see that the benzenes on either side here are benzenes. So that's fine, that's aromatic. So the question becomes then, can we, are, are the oxygens part of the aromatic ring or part of the aromatic system or not? Are these lone pairs in there or not? Okay, so first question is the flatness issue. If we're gonna have flatness all the way around these rings, then the oxygens have to be sp2 hybridized so that they can be flat and they can have that p orbital. If the oxygens are sp2 hybridized, that means that one lone pair is going to be in the p orbital and the other lone pair is going to be in the hybrid orbital. 
So one is, is in here, one is sticking out away from everything. And that's true over here as well. So if we want that to be flat and we want that to have the SP2 hybridization that allows for the resonance all the way around that entire system, then we have to also count those electrons as part of the pi system. So this, this molecule now has two, four, six, eight, 10, 12, 14, 16 electrons in the pi system. So is 16 a um, 4n plus 2 number? It's not. Uh, if we go back to the rules there, right, 16 isn't there. We can get 14 or 18, but not 16. So we would say that this is not aromatic. Count of electrons. So, um, other questions about that? We should let's look at one more that is um, where we can look at what happens with a cation. So what if there is a charge? Let's look at that. So this is a cycloheptatriene, cycloheptatriene, seven carbons. Let's look at that one versus the cation. Okay, so looking at the first one, we've got six pi electrons, so we fit the number, but this is not aromatic. Can anybody tell me why this first one is not aromatic? The, um, the count works there, but something else doesn't. What's going on in that one that makes it not aromatic? Not plain, right. It's not so um, there are two hydrogens here, which makes this sp3 hybridized. So actually, because of the limits of the geometry, it is pretty close to planar. Um, if you build it, you'd see it like it doesn't, it's pretty close to planar. The bigger issue is there's no p orbital here. So the pi system, instead of forming a ring, kind of makes more like a U shape. But they can't have resonance all the way around the ring because there's no p orbital there to distribute the electrons through. Um, so, so that's more the issue here. Over on this side, then, if we look at the cation, now we have gotten rid of that problem. So there's only one hydrogen there. It's been de um, not deprotonated, but it's lost H with its electrons. And so now, since this is only has three things attached, this is now sp2 hybridized, which means it does have that empty p orbital coming out. And in this case, it would be kind of like going back, going out and coming and going back. So perpendicular to the screen. Um, there is a p orbital there, and that can share in resonance. So where this one can only have resonance around, like in a U shape, this one can now have resonance all the way around, still only six pi electrons. And so this one is aromatic. That one is aromatic. Um, and, and the consequence of that, the chemical consequence of that, is that this molecule would be really Normally, we don't think of carbon hydrogen bonds as being very acidic. But this one probably would be pretty acidic because if a base deprotonated this, it leaves a, um, well, no, that's not quite right. So it's not acidic because it would have to lose its, its electrons too. Um, but you could, you could actually get the hydrogen to come off with its electrons here, not deprotonated with its electrons and make something like this that's fairly stable. Um, 
So this hydrogen almost can act as like a leaving group. And if this were not a hydrogen, if this were, you know, a halogen or something, that would be an extremely good leaving group because this is a very stable carbocation because it's aromatic and has all this resonance. Okay, uh, other questions about that? Also answering Irina's question from before, if there's something with a negative charge, but a negative charge would add electrons. Uh, I think we looked at this one before. This is kind of what I was thinking of when I made that conjugate base comment. Um, this molecule is a particularly stable carbon ion. Normally we don't think of carbon anions as stable, but in this case, this is aromatic. One, two, three, four, five, six electrons is aromatic. Um, so if you have cyclopentadiene, you can actually deprotonate it pretty easily because the conjugate base is aromatic and especially stable. So to the question earlier, if the number of lone pairs and double bonds is odd, aromatic. Yeah, I, I mean, I think that works okay. But the issue is things like this, you have to, you have to make sure you know, whether or not the lone pair is a part of the pi system. If the lone pair is a part of the pi system, you count it. If it's not like in this case, then you don't count it. Um, if you have two lone pairs like here, this is aromatic, because one of those lone pairs is in the pi system. And the other one is not. So that's that's my trouble with your rule there. It's not that it's wrong because it does work, but you still have to make the decision of which electrons you're going to count in the system and which ones are not. And if there are only double bonds. Uh, like this one, then you still have to be careful of the other rules to make sure that, you know, because this has six electrons, but is not aromatic. Um, okay, and so Nicole asks, so when there's two lone pair groups, you can always put one to go with the whole system. Right. One of those lone pairs can occupy a p orbital while the other is in the hybrid orbital. Other questions before we move on to the quiz? Oops, let's see again. We'll go look at that too. Oh, that's right. The quiz is already loaded. Yes, Irina, go ahead. So that's on the final on the exam, one A and D. Yes. Okay. We'll get to the final next. Let's go through the quiz and then and then we'll start looking at the final if that's okay. All right. So for the quiz here, um, most people got the first part, which is great. Uh, the only thing that's really not exactly tricky, but just to watch for is the priority rules that we talked about where the benzene is named based on its substituent following those particular rules. So this gets number one and is called aniline. And then we count around to try to get the lowest possible numbers. So we go two, three, four, five, six. So this one becomes two chloro, five nitro aniline. 
the next one just has two iodines, so that one can either be one, two, diiodobenzene, or we can call that ortho. benzene and then the last one um that's phenol so this is para bromophenol or four bromophenol All right, um, ortho para directors. So I got some interesting answers on this. Uh, most of you, I think, basically knew what you were talking about. Um, but there were a couple important things to notice here. First of all, the question is asking about directors. It doesn't say what is ortho, what is para, and what is meta. It doesn't ask to define the relationship. It says, what are the directors um, when referring to reactions? So I wanted you to explain how substituents direct the next electrophile to a specific position on the benzene. So an ortho para director directs the electrophile to the ortho and para positions because of the way that it donates electron density into the ring, making partial negative charges on those sites. So those sites are the most nucleophilic. Um, so that's the kind of thing we we're looking for. Or I was looking for. Um, making the ortho and para sites more nucleophilic. And then with meta directors, they're pulling the electron density out of the ring, so deactivating. And that, it's not so much making the meta position more nucleophilic, but the, um, the pulling the electron density out of the ring makes the ortho and para positions extremely uh, electrophilic. And so they can't, they're not going to react with an electrophile. They're already positive. Uh, and then giving an example of that, um, hopefully with some resonance, showing the charges, showing that you're activating by increasing the electron density in the ring, deactivating by removing electron density from the ring. So putting all those things together is what you needed for full points there. Okay, and then this one, uh, can the following synthesize the project product shown? The answer is no, because the directing groups are in the wrong order here. Um, so after the first reaction, you would alkylate the benzene. So you put that isopropyl group on like that. Then after the next reaction, you're oxidizing that uh, isopropyl group off. So that's going to lead to a carboxylic acid. To that, uh, that is now a meta director and this is if you went wrong on this one this is where most people went wrong it is an electron withdrawing group making it a meta director and that means that the final product will have the wrong regiochemistry it'll be a different isomer so the the product that's made by the sequence of this reactions uh, of these reactions makes the meta product, not the para product. If we wanted the para product, we would have to switch these two steps so that the oxidation comes at the end um, because the isopropyl group here, the alkyl group is an ortho para director. And because it's kind of bulky, we would expect that to direct the bromine para, and then we can oxidize it to get that product. So that was the issue there. All right, and so for this one, um, so, and this is true for the final also. When it asks you to draw a mechanism or a curved arrow mechanism, that means every step has to be accounted for. So every time there's a protonation or a deprotonation or whatever happens, you have to draw that. Um, so in this case, we first make the electrophile. by attaching the chlorine to the aluminum and then having it kind of come off as a leaving group. Uh, 
that's not quite right. Hold on. That and then that can come off because this be becomes such a strong bond between the CL and the aluminum. Okay, so now this is the electrophile. And then the benzene. The bromobenzene can attack the electrophile. And here's where I saw some, most people got something like this, you know, you can get this from the book. But remember that in electrophilic aromatic substitution, there's a clear sequence of steps. So this attaches, at that position there was already a hydrogen, so that's still there. So that means that the um, positive charge, the carbocation, is becomes the next one over because we took the electrons from that double bond to make that connection. So then in the last step, we use some base, and you can specify like this something in the, in the reaction is the base, or you can just say base. And in this case, that hydrogen is going to get deprotonated, which reforms the aromatic ring. And that's your product. So um, if we were in person and doing like a regular timed final exam, uh, I would be more clear about you, these mechanisms you need to know, these mechanism, mechanisms you don't need. Um, but now since everything's kind of on your own, I'm expecting that you're gonna look up mechanisms. So you, it, it's more like you have to figure out what is the mechanism you're going to use. And then you look in your book or at previous notes and you find a related or the same mechanism and you draw those steps accordingly. So I'm not expecting that you know all of this off the top of your head for the final but that you can identify the reaction, find the correct mechanism, and, uh, and use it. All right, so the other question uh, that we often have, so we write mechanisms, but we also often are asking for a reaction scheme or a sequence of reactions or a synthesis plan or a synthetic plan, something like that, which is more like, which is not the mechanisms, not showing what the electrons are doing in every single step, but rather showing um, sequence of reactions. So what do I, if I were doing this in a lab, what do I need to add first and then add after that and then add after that? Um, so in this case, we would start with benzene. And we know we need to add chlorine and we know we need to add um, this acyl group. So the question just becomes, what is the correct order? Uh, and in this case, we have to add the acyl group first because this is the meta director. We can't add the chlorine first because chlorine is an ortho para director. So to add this, we use the acyl chloride with aluminum trichloride, which makes this. And then we add the chlorine So that we can get that meta direction that we want. Yeah. So when you're doing that's that's kind of the the trickiest part or the thing that's most different about benzene reactions is you have to make sure they're in the right order because different groups have different directing abilities. And so you'll get a chance to try this again down here. All right. Let's look at these. Um, let's look at these reactions. So. A, I know 6A gave everybody a lot of trouble. We talked about it in, um, in these sessions and in office hours and all that. The, um, 
One thing that I think threw people off at first is this has a benzene ring in it, but there's no reactions on the benzene. So we don't need to use any of the benzene reactions here. We're just using phenol, and we're actually taking advantage of the acidity of phenol, the fact that it can be deprotonated, to then substitute it. Um, so there were a couple answers that were okay here. The best way to do this is, again, to recognize that we have two carbons and an oxygen that we're adding. Um, and so you could actually do this with epoxide chemistry. You could epoxidate that that oxygen to get the OH. So we could use this as a nucleophile to open up the epoxide. And then you could oxidize that um, oxidize that alcohol to the aldehyde. So there you go, two carbons and an aldehyde. Um, that's probably the best way synthetically to do it. Some people chose instead to deprotonate this with something like sodium hydride or sodium hydroxide, which is okay, and then react it with um, like an aldehyde with a, with a leaving group on this alpha carbon, like a bromine here, which is, um, there are some reasons that that doesn't work great, but we haven't really gotten to them yet. So I think that's okay. That was okay. So if you did that, that was fine. Okay, here's another typical aromatic chemistry. So we start with toluene. We have to oxidize the methyl group to uh, a carboxylic acid, but we get, again have to be careful of the order because we want to add things ortho and para to this methyl group. So we can't oxidize it first because as soon as it becomes a carboxylic acid, it's now a meta director instead of an ortho para director. So we have to do our ortho para stuff first, um, and and we have to get that in the right order as well. So for instance, let's say okay, uh, I know this is an ortho para director, so I'm going to add uh, the Cl first and make that ortho. What's wrong with this? Well, the problem here is we know that the para position favored the sterics. So the product here, the major product, would not be the orthochlorotoluene. It would be the parachlorotoluene. And that's not what we want. So that's not a good choice. Better choice is to do the nitration first. which gets the nitro group in that para position, and also now recognize that nitro is a meta director. So me methyl is ortho para, nitro is meta, which means both substituents now are directing to the ortho positions, which is exactly where, they want, where we want them for the chlorine. So if we add the chlorine now, both of those directing groups are going toward the ortho positions. Then for the final step, we can oxidize to make the carboxylic acid, to make the benzoic acid. So how do you know what order to use them in? Well, you have to think about the directors. So which position are the existing substituents directing to? Um, part of that can be, at least at first, can be trial and error. So you can just do it in whatever order, and then think really carefully about each step. Where would this direct? Where would this direct? Is this an ortho para director or is this a meta director? Is it going to go to the ortho position, the para position, the meta position? So thinking about the directors and where those substituents are directing in each step, that's the key to getting them in the right order, which is the whole point of these aromatic type syntheses. Um, so think about each step and where the existing substituents are directing to. So like, if I draw this first and I think, okay, where is methyl directing to? Well, methyl is an ortho para director, so that means it's directing to the ortho and para positions, favoring the para position because of sterics, because it's less crowded. So I'm going to expect that the methyl group directs the nitro group to the para position. 
And so I think about that for each step. Where are the existing groups directing the new groups to? Where are they, where, where are they making the new groups go? Okay, for the last one, this is a good example of where it's helpful to work backwards. Um, because if you just start with a small molecule and then you think, oh man, I've got to build this whole thing up from this thing, um, it seems like there's a lot of steps. And in some of your quizzes, I saw kind of you struggling with that and trying to figure out how you were going to do that. But if we think about it backwards, really what we're, really, really what we're doing is we just have to get back to this tert butyl group, um, which is here. So all we're really doing is adding a tert butyl group to this molecule that's already intact, this dimethyl aniline. Um, so in that case, we can think, well, how would we do that if that were the only reaction here? Um, we would use a, uh, alkylation chemistry, benzene alkylation. So we might do something like this. Like if that were just a, a standalone thing and this weren't the starting material, we might think of it some, something like this, where we have this dimethyl aniline, it reacts here, puts it on that position because that's an ortho para director and the ortho positions are already taken up. So that would just work. Um, and then if we think like, oh, well then how are we gonna get to this molecule from this one? That's kind of the wrong question because this is actually the molecule that's very similar to this one. So we can um, substitute there, just even like a simple SN1 substitution would work here, make that chloride, and then we simply need to add that whole benzene thing. aluminum trichloride as a catalyst to put that on that position and make that product. So again, in these transformations, you're not limited on what you can add. Um, I think a lot of, some people that I saw felt like you had to start with just benzene and like individually put these different pieces on there. Um, that's not how these work. You start with what you start with and then you can add anything you want. So to add this piece, we can add that piece, that whole piece. Okay, uh, other questions about the quiz? All right, then we'll move on to the... So a couple things um, about rules. This is an exam. This is the final exam, right? It is an at-home exam. I'm expecting that you are using the materials from class and completing this exam. So I'm expecting you're looking up, looking up reagents, looking up conditions in the book. Um, I'm not expecting that you sit down and, and just write this like you would a normal exam with no help or no, um, with no aids there, that, that you would just like do this out of your head. So there definitely is stuff in here that I would not expect you to be able to do off the top of your head, but I would expect you to do with references of the books and the notes and stuff like that. Um, so please use those things when you're doing the exam. Secondly, this is your work. This is meant to be a measure of your ability to synthesize the materials from the class and put them together into an exam. Um, so as with the last exam, you may not get help from other people. You can't collaborate. You can't ask other people in the class, what did you get for this synthesis or how did you do this? Um, don't, you can't um, like post your questions to online forums um, or I, I noticed in some of the quizzes, which is okay because it's quizzes, it seemed like some of you just sort of Googled the question and then wrote down stuff that other people said that wasn't exactly 
like how we had been talking about it or wasn't what was in the book. Um, sometimes you're using reactions that we haven't discussed. And I don't know if you got them from somebody else or from somewhere on the internet. Um, but for this exam, don't do that. All of that makes it very clear that you're not doing your own work. Um, so use the book, use the notes, use the videos, come ask. But, uh, don't get help from other people. Make sure that this is your own individual work. Um, so thank you for doing that. All right, so let's go through. Uh, we're going to have some questions on 1A. And go back and check it, 1A and D. All right. So complete the following reactions. Draw major organic products. Include stereochemistry for chiral, chiral products. Um, all right. So I'm not going to tell you the answer. Um, but what I will say is this is the reaction that we have talked about, and you can go back and look at it. Uh, I will give you the hint that this is a reaction that deals with reacting alcohols, and there are two alcohols in this molecule. So you have to um, look that up in the book and think about the mechanism and think about which alcohol it's more likely to react with, because it will work with one and not with the other. For D, so here we have aromatic reactions, and we just talked about these. Yeah, so that's that's kind of the, the point of the question. So read about that particular reaction and think about why it might work on one of those positions and not on the other. And I can get you. Um, and really, it's the same hint for this one. We've got two rings and, and some various different choices of positions of where a bromine could go. This is the bromine, bromine aromatic bromination, right? Um, so the bromine is going to go somewhere on these benzene rings. So then your question is, or, or your, your job is to figure out which ring does it go on? Um, and I'll give you a hint, it has to do with directing groups. Which ring is more active or more activated to electrophilic aromatic substitution? Which ring is toward electrophilic aromatic substitution, that should help you get to um, that answer. All right, so go ahead and type in if you have some other questions. But I want to talk about um, what's probably the hardest part of the exam, which is the end. We've done a lot of these all year, all semester. So um, I hope you can you can figure these out as well. So for each of these, I want you to not only draw like the numbered plan of what you're going to do, but actually show what each step does in the transformation. Um, so that part of that is I can see your thinking and I can see where you might have um, gone wrong and I can give you partial credit. Uh, and part of that is because I don't want you to just guess random reagents uh, without knowing what they do. So I want to see that you know what each of the reagents do. Um, also, there are eight of these shown, and you only have to do six of them. And with these synthesis transformations, especially as they get more difficult, uh, sometimes you just get stuck and like you just can't. You, you're looking at it, you're trying different stuff, and you just cannot figure out how to make this this thing. Um, and that's okay. That happens. So I want to give you the chance to do that for at least two of these to just kind of throw them out. Uh, you don't get extra credit for trying the extra ones. Um, if you'd like to, you can try them. That's fine. Um, and but uh, you have to be, please be very specific of which six you want me to grade if you do more than six. Um, so um, I'm not just going to grade all of them and pick the best ones. Uh, let me know which ones you want. So if you really can't figure one out, you really don't know what you're doing, or you're just like. You did it, but you're really not not sure that it works. Um, then just skip that one, and so then you've got six of them to do. And uh, I'm guessing this will take the most time. So uh, I would start on these as soon as you can, just to give yourself time to think about them. Sometimes you know you're thinking about it at some random time of day, um, and suddenly you get that flash of inspiration of like, oh yeah, that I could do that. Um, so. And that also gives you plenty of time to ask if you have questions. I'm not going to tell you the answers, obviously, but um, if you want to show me 
some things that you have tried, I can say, mm, I don't know if that works, or um, maybe help point you in the right direction if something is, if, if a lot of these are just completely, you're completely stuck. So all of that said, um, are there other questions or are there other things you want to review or go over now? Um, have you had a chance to look at this? Maybe you'll have more coming up on, on Monday, uh, Wednesday. Yes, that's correct. So a question for the last question on the exam, we only need the products from each step, not the whole curve arrow mechanism, right? Yes, that's correct. So you want the reagents and the products for each step, um, not the specific mechanism of how the electrons move around in each step. So just like what we've done on the previous exams with the numbered steps, except I, I want you to make sure you draw the product from each step also. Uh, while you're while you're thinking about things other things um hopefully my message made sense on blackboard so i have um uh, i'm still working on on getting the grades in so thanks to those of you who ha have all your stuff in and thanks for your patience um should be caught up with the quizzes shortly and then i'll um keep working on lab notebooks and the research papers for those of you who uh choose to do that um the so I put in, I, I, the, the final exam is actually out of 115 points, but I temporarily changed it to 100 so that your exam average in that column. Um, and that should give you a pretty good idea of your overall average column. Now I know there's a couple of quizzes yet to come, to, uh, or a quiz to get the grades in there. I know that there are, um, there's another round of lab notebooks and some pre-labs that I have to get in there. Um, and also, yeah, but generally because it's based on categories, it should give you a good sense of your overall grade. If you got on the final, what you've been averaging on the other exam and you don't do the final project. So that's your, that's what your grade would be. If you do better on the final than on your overall exam average from the first two exams, then that score will go up. If you do worse on the final, it'll go down. If you complete the, um project then that should raise your grade a bit but only if the project is uh generally is better than whatever your exam or whatever your overall weighted average is so if your average is a 90 percent um then you have to get uh, a 90 percent on the exam on the on the exam you have to get a 90 percent on the project or more than 90% on the project for that to help you. So if your grade is very high, there's not a lot of incentive um, to do the project. But um, you know, you could potentially go up a little bit. Okay, so a question back from the exam. So two E and F. Right, so two E and F are pretty similar. Um, pretty similar questions, uh, but because of the directing groups. What do you mean not F but E? Oh, just e. Yeah, uh, think about the directing groups. Uh, they're, they're both they're both questions about directing groups, their chlorination of benzene. And so the question is going to be where 
where is the chlorine going to be directed for the major product? Um, so think about where each of the substituents on the benzene would direct that chlorine and, um, and try to make a decision there about where the chlorine would do. In each case, in each of these two, there are basically two possible, there are two choices for your answer. Um, you can probably see that there's two positions that the chloride could go. So you have to decide which one is favored. So you can look at both. Um, I guess there's two things to look at there. One is just what type of directing group. So is it an ortho director, or ortho para director, or a meta director? And then also the strength of the directing groups. So something that is highly activating, strongly activating, is going to be a stronger director than something that is weakly activating. So um, you can think about that too. The degree of activation is also the strength of the direction. The, the stronger activators are also stronger directors. Other questions? Nothing? Everybody's good? All right, well, I guess that's it for today then, uh, unless you have other questions. You can always send me your questions. We'll be back here for our very last official class meeting on Wednesday. Um, I will have, I will be here Wednesday also at 11 and Friday. And then next week, exam week, uh, I'll still be here the regular times on Monday and Wednesday for last minute final exam questions um, or whatever. Um, so uh, yeah, the um, if you need other times, let me know. And hopefully the exam and everything is going okay. Um, please don't leave it till the last minute because again, this is a bigger exam than I would have given in class. Um, I'm I wrote this with the intention that you would be working on it for more than a week. So um, so please please use your time to do that. So good. Scared? Don't be scared. It's gonna be fine. All right, thanks everybody. Bye. Hi. Have a good day.